Thank you everyone for joining us for this evening's event. Uh, my name is Nick and I'm one of the events hosts here at Powell's Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting us, our website at powells.com. If you don't already do so, please follow us on our social media channels via Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Tonight, we are thrilled that we are all here tonight celebrating the work Dispatches from Anaris, Tales in Tribute to Ursula K. Le Guin. Named for the anarchist utopia in Ursula K. Le Guin's sci science fiction classic, The Dispossessed, Dispatches from Anaris accompanies the anarchic spirit of Le Guin's hometown of Portland, Oregon, while paying tribute to her enduring vision. In stories that range from fantasy to sci-fi to realism, some of Portland's most vital voices have come together to celebrate Le Guin's lasting leg legacy and influence on that most subversive of human faculties, the imagination. Um, moderating tonight, we are fortunate to have with us the editor of Dispatches from Anaris, Susan DeFreitas. She is the author of the novel Hot Season, which won a Gold Ippy Award. Her uh, work has been featured in the Writer's Chronicle, the Huffington Post, Story Magazine, Daily Science Fiction, Portland Mon Monthly, along with many other journals and anthologies. And she's served as a freelance editor and book coach since 2009. Um, this event will include an audience Q&A, so please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen if you'd like to ask a question, as well as if someone has typed a question you'd also like to know the answer to, please upvote that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, consider supporting Powell's and all these authors by purchasing a copy of Dispatches from Anaris. A link to buy the book, along with the books from the speakers tonight, will be shared in the chat a couple, uh, a couple times tonight. So, all right, well, Susan, thank you so much for joining us and we'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much, Nick. So, uh, wow. It's a surreal moment to be having this evening, uh, sharing this evening with all of you from afar. Of course, I had absolutely hoped to be doing so in, in person. And before we started tonight, we were kind of just sharing, you know, this is such a community uh, endeavor, this anthology. And it, it feels a bit strange to be uh, sharing its official launch from uh, these rooms in our homes, separate from one another. But it's my hope that in, in sharing this experience from afar, we will still be connecting in the community spirit of this anthology. And thank you for joining us this evening. Um, so I wanted to start by saying that, uh, I want to start by sending out a big thank you to Powell's for selecting Dispatches from Anares as one of its picks of the season. Yes, jazz hands. Um, it's such an honor to be uh, in, in such great company uh, with these other wonderful books cho chosen by your booksellers. So thank you for that. I also want to send out a big thank you to the estate of Ursula K. Le Guin uh, for giving their endorsement and support to this book. It, it is such an important thing to us to have that endorsement. This project, honestly, we would not have wanted to proceed in any other way. So thank you uh, to the estate of Le Guin for that uh, support. So I wanna share a little bit about uh, the background um, on this project and, and how I came to, to it, this work. Um, like many of you, I imagine my first introduction to the work of Ursula K. Le Guin came in the form of this slim but powerful volume, uh, A Wizard of Earthsea. And uh, this, I encountered this magical book on a bookshelf in my parents' library. And I was absolutely taken away by it. But at the same time, this book was just part of a feast of speculative fiction that I was basically just stuffing into my mouth one book after another as an older child and early tween. Because 
my folks were part of a speculative book of the month club, which some readers and viewers of a certain age will remember was was a service where you know that you'd get a, a catalog full of many wonderful titles and you could pick maybe 20 of them for a, a penny a piece and they'd be sent to you but thereafter they would send you a new title every month and in order to keep from incurring the charges associated with that title at full price you had to actually send it back and you know uh imagine my parents were slackers in some ways about this so there was this whole bookshelf of fabulous books and this is where i read the work of uh you know ray bradbury and stephen r donaldson and sherry tepper and cj cherry and pa patricia mckillop and more fabulous uh speculative authors than i can name and and to me Le Guin was just a, a a, a great you know writer of fantasy in the middle of that uh you were a member bev that's awesome in the middle of that feast it really wasn't until i moved uh to portland in 2009 that i really began to get a, a sense for how much greater the scope of Le Guin's work was than just the earth sea novels now, Le Guin was and is a legend in Portland. And when I moved there, I decided it was time to educate myself on her work. So that was when I read works like The Dispossessed. That was when I read books like The Lathe of Heaven. That was when I read The Left Hand of Darkness and had my mind absolutely blown. And in so many ways, I had the sense that her work exemplified the spirit of Portland, you know, left leaning, deeply questioning, super smart, very heart centered, but, you know, anarchist in spirit, definitely feminist and and what we might now think of as queer in its in its questioning and investigation of gender norms. Um, and, and further possibilities for gender. And in that time when I was educating myself on her work, just one book after another, blowing my mind and my heart wide open, Le Guin became my favorite author, and she still is. There is no other writer I have found who across her incredibly large bibliography was so consistently moved me on so many levels, intellectual, spiritual, moral, and more than anything, emotional. I, I think one of the hallmarks of Le Guin's work is a powerful emotional effect based in her deep work of character and culture. And as a sort of a fun aside, it was during that time that I found out that my mother had actually read the Earthsea novels when she was pregnant with me. So clearly we had some connection from way back when. Um, and then of course, in 2014, you know, after this incredible uh, career in speculative fiction, you know, in which her, her legacy on, on, you know, the genres of fantasy and science fiction like really cannot be overstated. The, the Literary Academy, you know, in the form of the National Book Award Committee, finally deigned to give the, the great lady, the speculative fiction giant, you know, a nod uh, by giving her a, a Lifetime Achievement Award, you know. And I'm sure they just sort of expected this little old lady to hobble up to the podium you know, say some humble words and then, you know, slip quietly off stage. But as we all know, that is absolutely not what she did. Le Guin took her five minutes in front of that podium and used it to speak truth to power, specifically to corporate power, specifically to corporate publishing. And in this, she inspired so many of us so deeply. 
And then it wasn't much longer, you know, in 2018, she passed. And to me, it was as if a great tree had fallen in our forest. And I was having a conversation earlier today with Roselle Medina from Oregon Humanities Magazine, in which I told him, it's really somewhat of a theme in my work, which readers of my novel Hot Season may recognize, that when someone who is so central to a community and have, has had so much influence on it and had been such an inspiration, when a person like that passes, often the only way or the only good way to fill the void that they have left behind is to find a way to embody their spirit and their work in your own life and in your own work. And that's what this anthology is for me. It's a way of doing that. And, you know, to extend this metaphor further, I had the feeling that if I looked around in the literary forest, not far from where Le Guin had fallen in Portland, I would find that a lot of the younger trees surrounding her were actually her offspring. And that is absolutely what I found when I put out the call for this anthology. It, there was such an up, a surge in, upsurgence of, of people with so much love for Le Guin's work and so much to say about her influence on theirs. You know, people, both, both speculative writers and literary writers. And so it was such a great pleasure to pull their work together in this anthology. And now to extend the, the metaphor even further and perhaps even to torture it, I would say that in our literary ecosystem, in our forest, our mycorrhizal fungal systems are strong because not only are all of these stories in conversation with, with themes in Le Guin's work, you know, and working to carry them forward in, into today, you know, to further that legacy, all of these stories I found were sort of in conversation with each other in often surprising ways in, in, in speaking to these same sorts of themes. And editing this anthology, or as I think of it, my favorite literary mixtape ever, has been a, the great pleasure and privilege of my professional life. Um, and I just wanna, you know, to share a little bit from the, the introduction that I wrote for this anthology. Le Guin told us herself in her essay collection, The Wave in the Mind, that the denigration, omission, and exception the female writer faces during her lifetime is only preparation for her disappearance after her death. And here she's speaking to the way female writers, no matter how large they may loom, no matter how successful they may be, are often systematically erased as the years go on after they have passed, erased from the canon. And I just have to say, you know, those of us who are storytellers and, and tellers of, of literary history, a particular kind of story, we cannot allow that to happen. We must insist upon her place in the canon and insist upon the importance of her legacy. And this anthology is one way of, of doing that. So I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. And I'm looking forward to um, hearing, sharing with you some of the um, stories from the contributors we have here this evening. Um, a note before we get started, we have unfortunately two readers who are not here with us this evening. The first is Michelle Ruiz Kyle, who's had a death in her family. Her dog died today, so she is not able to join us. And Lydia Yuknovich has sent me a, a series of emails, <laughs> very apologetic emails. She appears to be, uh, she says she's gotten, she wound up in some rural place where there's a storm bearing down. She may lose power. 
and she can get into email, but not into Zoom. So uh, Lydia, <laughs> stay safe. We hope you're okay out there. And uh, we hope to feature um, all of you, if, um, our, our two missing readers at a, a future event. Okay. So our first reader this evening will be Curtis C. Chen. Once a Silicon Valley software engineer, Curtis C. Chen now writes stories and runs puzzle games near Portland, Oregon. He's the author of the Kangaroo series of funny science fiction spy thrillers and has written for the Realm Originals, Ninth Step Murders, Machina, and Echo Park 2060, which is forthcoming. Curtis's short fiction has appeared in Playboy magazine, Daily Science Fiction, Oregon Reads Aloud, and elsewhere. His homebrew cat feeding robot was displayed in the Worlds Beyond Here exhibit at Seattle's Wing Luke Museum. Welcome, Curtis Chen. Thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks to Pals for hosting this event. Uh, it's great to be here. And yeah, so. I am going to read a little bit from my story in here, which is a, a reprint, but I, I'm so happy that uh, it's being included in this anthology in particular. Um, I, I can say a bit about my, my own personal connection to, to Ursula Le Guin, which is, uh, I believe the first the first book of hers that I read was The Left Hand of Darkness. Um, I think in high school, it might have been middle school. I mean, it's been a while, but uh, you know, whatever age it was, um, like Susan, it completely <laughs> blew my mind because I, uh, <laughs> I hadn't experienced a lot of those sort of themes and in, in the ways that they were being discussed in other kinds of science fiction that I'd read. You know, I. I Grown up, you know, watching Star Trek and Star Wars and reading a lot of like Asimov, you know, Bradbury, Clark, all that kind of, you know, golden age science fiction, which was, you know, a lot of, you know, more technologically focused. And, um, and, and with Ursula Le Guin's work, um, it was a, you know, a decidedly different perspective. And I really appreciated that and it kind of, you know, Broaden my horizons. Um, the other book of hers that I remember reading back then was uh, "The Word for World is Forest," uh, which is part of the Hainish cycle, which is also like it's like it, it, it deals with you know some different kinds of themes in terms of colonization and war and all that. Um, but again, it was you know something that I hadn't seen a lot in a lot of the other science fiction I had been reading, and so. That also spurred me to seek out other, you know, different kinds of stories by different kinds of writers, and um, and that was before I ever met her. Um, and I, I did actually meet her. Actually, my first. Um, sorry, this, this is going on uh, a little bit long, but um, but I I was fortunate, incredibly fortunate, in that the the first formal writing workshop I took it was the, my last year of university, and it was. Uh, a seminar so it was taught in the Milford style with a critique circle and all that and you know maybe 15 or 20 students um, and we all you know submitted work um, and then read each other's work and critiqued work um, guided by the instructors one of whom was Ursula Le Guin <laughs> and she had been invited to do this um, and it, it was incredible because I hadn't I, I got wanted to be, I had been interested in writing for, for a number of years at that point, um, but, you know, was still very young, had no idea what I was doing, and to be kind of thrown into that situation with someone who was so, not just, not just accomplished, but I think even at that point, like, she had a very clear idea of what she was doing um, with her fiction and with her life, and you know, like Susan referenced the, her speech at the National Book Awards. I, I feel like that was sort of, you know, um, that was at a point, I think, where she recognized in her career that, you know, she was, she was 
able to give, you know, pretty close to zero fucks. Um, sorry. <laughs> Hope there are no kids here. Don't say that word, kids. <laughs> um, you know, and she was able to, as Susan said, speak truth to power, like very, very directly. Um, and it is an amazing speech. If you haven't seen it, like, you can look it up online. Um, but even in, as I said, like that, the workshop I took with her, um, like she was very direct and, you know, and, and I've heard of things like this happening in other writers' workshops, like where, you know, people get very direct critiques about their work and often it's very young writers who aren't prepared for that kind of frank discussion of craft because it, they haven't, you know, gotten to the point where they can separate themselves from their work um, very well and, you know, to, to sort of process um, that kind of feedback in that kind of environment. Um, but it was, you know, it was incredibly helpful. And um, like I said, I was incredibly fortunate to, to work with her at that stage in my own development as a writer. Um, and then, you know, several years, many years later, um, when I moved up to the Portland area, um, I was, I uh, was able to go to a Powell's event where she was, you know, speaking and signing. Um, it was for one of her later collections, and it was um, it was a year before my first novel was uh, scheduled to come out. So I'd signed the contract and done all that, and uh, so I actually got to you know catch up with her a little bit and let her know that I had continued writing and I had you know sold a novel and it was going to be published, and it was, and I'm really glad that I was able to you know, have that kind of closure for myself with her because she, this was just a few years before she passed. And, you know, even though we weren't very close um, and we hadn't really kept in touch over those years, it was just, um, you know, I'm glad that, I'm glad that I got to say that to her and to have that last conversation with her. Um, all right, okay. Um, I probably <laughs> used up more than my five minutes, but uh, if it's okay, I'm just going to read a little bit from my story <laughs> since uh, we, we are missing two readers. So hopefully <laughs> we can use this time. To, uh, okay, so uh, my story here is, uh, it, it is, the title is Laddie Come Home, which is a terrible pun like many of my, my story titles. <laughs> but the main character is, is, is it, is named LAD, which is an acronym, L-A-D, stands for Local Administrator Device. So it is a, it's an AI that runs inside a little uh, computer, inside a pendant like this. And uh, yeah, so most of it is from LAD's point of view. And this is a little ways in the story when LAD has gotten into sort of bad situations, trying to figure out how to get out of it when, you know, it's, it doesn't, it can't really do much since it's just kind of hanging off the necklace here. Oh, that's not the right page. Okay, sorry. Uh, where is this? Okay, here we go. Lad kept hoping Febby would go outside the house to play, thus providing an opportunity to scan for nearby wireless networks. But she stayed in her room all day with the window closed. Incoming audio indicated writing, graphite or clay material in lateral contact with cellulose surface, which Lad guessed was some schoolwork. There seemed to be an inordinately large amount of it for a 13 to 15 year old child. The good news was that Febby's high galvanic skin response made for efficient charging, and Lad was back to 100% battery in less than an hour. With power to spare, Lad accelerated main CPU clock speed to maximum and unlocked the pendant's onboard GPU for digital signal processing. Sound was the only currently available external signal and Lad had to squeeze as much information out of that limited data stream as possible. The voice command interface package included a passive sonar module that could be used for range finding. Lad loaded that into memory and began building a crude map of the house from echo patterns. After the family ate a meal, likely dinner based on the internal clock and local sunset time, 
Lad heard footsteps heading from the ground floor down a different set of concrete steps, likely into a basement or storm cellar. Febby stayed upstairs in her room. There was no way to adjust the directionality of the necklace microphones, but Lad increased the gain on the incoming audio and utilized all available noise reduction and bandpass filters. When Lad isolated Willem Mundine's voice print, 91% confidence, system behavior overrides kicked in and the Bluetooth radio drivers shot up in priority. As implied by earlier data, earlier data and now confirmed, Mundine was being held captive in the basement of this house. But Mundine was too far away and there was too much interference from the building structure for a Bluetooth signal to reach his body net. The only thing Lad could do was listen. If Mundine said any words, they were unintelligible. Mostly he screamed. Those noises were interspersed with shouting, also unintelligible, and sounds that the analysis software identifies, identified as rigid objects striking bare human skin. System rules kept demanding that Lad activate Mundine's implanted rescue locator beacon, more commonly known as a kidnap and ransom, KR stripe. But Lad couldn't control any devices while disconnected from the body net. The fall through rules recommended requesting user inter intervention from other nearby humans. After careful consideration, Lad decided to risk making contact. Lad waited until Febby was alone in the bathroom to speak to her. Hello, Febby, Lad said. Don't be afraid. Sonar indicated that Febby was sitting. Lad's motion sensors measured her neck muscles moving, likely turning her head to look around. Who's talking? She asked quietly. Where are you? I'm hanging around your neck, Lad said. Look down. I'll flash a light, three times each in red, green, and blue. Lad gave her 1,000 milliseconds to move her eyes, then activated the pendant's status lights. The three-way OLEDs burned a lot of power, but Lad believed this was an emergency. A talking necklace, Febby said. Cool. Listen, Febby, Lad said. I need your help. I'll stop there. Thank you. Yay. I'm so glad. This is, it's just bringing back the whole story for me. Yeah. And such an unusual point of view, right, Stephen? We've got Stephen Allred joining us here. Lots of our awesome contributors are joining us. That makes me happy. Um, the part of what I, I've absolutely taken with with this story was that point of view and the way it's kind of a mystery you know, to solve where you have to figure out what's happening through the point of view of this AI. Super awesome. All right. Our next reader tonight is David D. Levine. David D. Levine is the author of Nebula Award winning, of the Nebula Award winning novel, Arabella of Mars, sequels Arabella and the Battle of Venus, and Arabella the Traitor of Mars and over 50 science fiction and fantasy stories. His story, tica, 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 won the Hugo, and he has been shortlisted for awards, including the Hugo, Nebula, Campbell, and Sturgeon. Stories have appeared in Asimov Science Fiction, Analog Science Fiction and Fact, the Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction, Tor.com, numerous year's best anthologies, and his award-winning collection, Space Magic. Welcome, David Levine. Hello. Um, this, uh, this particular story um, is a reprint, uh, and I chose it to submit to this anthology uh, because it's, it takes place in Ursula's hometown of Portland, Oregon, uh, also my hometown. And incidentally, a big chunk of the story takes place in Powell's. Um, uh, the story has a middle-aged woman as a protagonist, and the story deals with questions of peaceful coexistence rather than grim survivalism in the, in the aftermath of disaster. Uh, it's kind of a Buddhist story, 
in it in that in the end the protagonist's main struggle is to make peace with herself and to figure out who she is in the absence of the society and the men that have defined her um so the name of the story is finding joan um and uh, how long how long do we have about five minutes yeah you can certainly take a little longer okay well i'll around. just i'll just read I'll just read until a horrific cliffhanger and then stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the silence had been her first clue, though she hadn't realized it at the time. Even before they'd emerged from the cave in which they'd spent a long weekend meditating and eating vacuum-packed saita and curry, Joan had noticed that the bird song that had echoed off the cave walls on the way down was strangely absent on the return trip. This struck her as odd, but trying to hang on for a little while longer to the quiet mind she'd just spent so many hours cultivating, she resolved to notice it and then let it go, rather than allowing her monkey mind to grab onto it and try to find a reason. The four of them hiked without speaking along the last gravelly stretch of cave floor before the entrance. Joan was dead tired from the long clamber back out of the cave, and her left foot squished in its shoe on every step from the deeper than expected underground rivulet she'd stepped in a few hundred yards back. Although she'd had a relaxing three-day holiday from her everyday life, right then she couldn't wait to get to the car, to sunlight and warmth and dry clothes. She planned to sleep through the drive home, then asked Dan to take her to Old Wives' Tales for a proper sit-down dinner. Then Roger, who was in the lead, took in a sharp, sharp breath. Joan, Joan nearly bumped into his skinny back before realizing he'd stopped dead. What, she said. Roger only pointed forward and up. Annoyed, Jeff, Joan stepped up next to him and sighted along his pointing arm at the sky outside the cave mouth. The sky was a mass of roiling brown clouds. Is that a storm brewing, she asked. Doesn't look like any storm I've ever seen, Roger replied, stroking his raggedy mustache. Coral and Bethany joined them a moment later. Coral was Joan's friend. They'd met when they were both volunteering at Friends of Trees, three years younger than Joan at 55, though thinner and with more of a fashion sense. She was just as much of a novice at caving as Joan. Bethany was Roger's wife, and like him, she was an experienced caver, 30-something, blonde, lean, and fit. Neither of them had ever seen a sky like that either, but at least it didn't seem to be raining. The whole expedition had been Coral's idea. She'd been the one to introduce Joan to Roger and Bethany, who lived in her apartment complex, and it had been she who thought that a long weekend in a cave would be a perfect way for her and Joan to get away from their daily lives and find some inner peace. In exchange for Roger and Bethany's caving expertise and the loan of some equipment, they do all the cooking and provide instruction in meditation. The cave had been quiet and peaceful, the company pleasant enough, but still Joan felt obligated apologetic for her heavy, awkward body and for the way she felt she was holding the others back, concerned that Roger and Bethany might not enjoy the vegetarian meals she'd prepared, afraid that Coral would regret bringing her along. Still, she did feel a bit calmer and counted the weekend as a qualified success. But as soon as Joan squeezed herself through the narrow cave mouth, uh, she was the only one of the four for whom it was much of a squeeze, she realized that something was seriously wrong. Every tree in the vicinity looked sick. Leaves drooped limp with many lying on the ground as though it were late fall instead of early spring. Small branches sagged. Even the conifers were shedding needles like a month old Christmas tree. The undergrowth looked no better. Something's wrong with the trees, she said. Not just the trees, Roger said. Joan followed his gaze. A dead squirrel lay in the path. They all looked at it in silence. It lay on its back, white belly exposed and little paws curled, eyes open. There were no visible marks, no swelling, no bleeding, no sign of what had killed it. Squirrels die all the time, Bethany said, prodding it with a stick, but she didn't sound very sure of herself. Birds, Coral said, pointing to one side of the path. Joan didn't understand what she'd meant until she realized that the brush held dozens of little brown birds, blending in with the undergrowth, difficult to see because they weren't moving at all. Nor were there any flies or insects crawling on them. Joan poked at the loose mulch with the toe of her boot gray with cave mud. Nothing scrabbled away from the disturbance, but a pill bug rolled down the path and lay still. She poked it gently with a fingernail, dead. 
Suddenly, Drone's throat felt tight. We've got to get out of here. Coral was staring in all directions as though expecting something to leap on her. What's happening here? Her voice trembled with near panic. I don't know, Roger said, but I'm leaving right now. He started down the hill with deliberate haste, crashing through hanging branches and sending gravel rattling down the trail ahead of him. Be careful, Bethany said from behind. But when Joan turned back, she saw Bethany coming on nearly as fast as Roger was departing. Joan picked up her own pace to match. As she hurried down the trail, minding her footing on the loose gravel, Joan's anxiety grew. The lowering sky was a sick yellow-brown color, churning and seething like a pot of dirty poison on a low boil. A dead crow lay atop a patch of wilted fiddlehead ferns like some ghastly entree. And there was no bird song, no grasshoppers or crickets, no rumble of traffic. Interstate 84 was miles away, but when they'd entered the cave on Friday, this traffic had been clearly audible. What the hell could have caused this? Joan wasn't in the best of shape, and after half an hour of rapid descent, her heart was hammering in her ears and her breath was ragged. Hold on a minute, she gasped and leaned against a tree for a moment. You don't look good, Carl said. You're flushed. You too. Carl's skin was bright pink, shiny and taut like a balloon. Carl looked down at her arms with alarm. What the hell? Roger, hearing the exchange, turned back and climbed up the hill toward them. He was as pink as Carl, but didn't seem to have noticed it. Give me your hand. He pressed Carl's forearm with his thumb. The thumbprint turned white and it took several seconds to return to his previous color. Ah, you're just sunburned is all. Carl shook her head. Roger, we've just spent three days in a cave. We've been out here for less than an hour and it's cloudy. How could I possibly get sunburned? Roger put on his smug, I'm an outdoorsman and you aren't expression. <laughs> you can get a nasty burn even on a cloudy day. But Joan was thinking about the dead squirrel. I don't think it's just sunburn. They all looked at her. I think it's radiation. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, and that story finding Joan, you know, as an editor really reminded me of the lathe of heaven with all of its various alternate Portlands. Um, so yeah, thank you for, for sharing a bit of that. Okay, our final reader before we open this up to Q&A is going to be Lainey Zumas. Lainey Zumas won the 2019 Oregon Book Award for her national best-selling novel, Red Clocks, which was also shortlisted for the Orwell Prize for Political Fiction and the Newcomb Prize for Speculative Fiction. Red Clocks was a New York Times book review editor's choice and was named a best book of 2018 by The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Huff Post, Entropy, and the New York Public Library. Vulture called it one of the hundred most important books of the 21st century so far. Zumas is also the author of Farewell Navigator, Stories, and the novel, The Listeners. Her fiction and nonfiction have appeared in Granta, the Times Literary Supplement, Guernica, Bomb, The Cut, Portland Monthly, Tin House, and elsewhere. Lainey, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Susan. Um, and thank you, David and Curtis. Your readings were great. Um, I'm really um, happy to be part of this anthology because as Susan was describing in, in her intro, Le Guin has obviously had an outsized effect on people around the world. But in Portland, you know, this community claims her and her brilliance in a in a really intimate and personal way. And um, and I'm not from Portland. I've only lived here for about 11 years, but I I love it enough that I kind of want to <laughs> I want to become a Portlander. Um, and so, you know, like Susan, I came to Le Guin when I was little reading the, the Ursi books and um, Kind of just thinking of her as this, you know, storyteller. Um, but then, as an adult, I started to become interested in um, Le Guin's awareness of storytelling as a core um, vehicle for social and political change, um, and and kind of as well as you know her writing on craft. You know, I'm a I teach writing, and steering the craft is a really uh, great um, collection of essays on craft that that Le Guin. Le Guin put out. Um, 
but really the sense that um, that she had both you know enacted in her books, but also you know in the in the speech that both Curtis and Susan mentioned. Um, I just want to share a quote from that speech that I love, and um, I think kind of encapsulates the power of her, um, the power and, and strength of, of her ways of connecting literature and politics. This is from the 2014 award acceptance speech. We live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often begin in art and very often in our art, the art of words. And um, that, that idea is so important to me and, and, um, and, and is shared, you know, that's inherited from a, a lot of thinkers and um, she put it in a, in a way that I will never forget. Um, and so when I started talking with Susan about uh, a piece to include in this anthology, um, you know, we were reflecting on Le Guin's interest in uh, polar exploration and also on sort of uh, women's stories that get buried or untold or uh, just sort of dismissed as, you know, Susan mentioned after their deaths. And um, in, in my novel, Red Clocks, there's a character called the Polar Explorer who um, did all this amazing stuff, but was you know, never remembered for it because when she tried to publish her scientific data, uh, no one would believe she had collected it. And so it was published under a man's name. Um, and this is in the kind of mid, uh, mid to late 19th century. And um, I had a bunch of outtakes from Polar Explorer sections of Red Clocks that I decided to put together for a very short story for this anthology. Um, and it's it's really in the spirit of Le Guin kind of peeling back a lot of the our conventional and inherited ways of understanding the world and saying, actually, we need different frames. We need different lenses and our stories can be those pathbreaking you know, frames. Um, so this, story is called The Polar Explorer. In the summer of 1875, Ivor Minerva Dotter lied her way onto a steamship leaving Copenhagen for the polar north. Not until Aureus had rounded the Jutland Peninsula did the captain understand a woman was aboard. He told the explorer, we have no choice but to bear you. The odds of her standing on that deck, given who she was, poor female and Faroese, were long. Her uncle had taught her arithmetic in Danish. She had taught herself everything else. In the Arctic Ocean north of Siberia, pack ice closed around Aureus and locked it fast for eight months. Minerva Dotter spent the besetment recording temperature, salinity, atmospheric pressure, chlorides in the ice. She mapped and she measured. By the time the ship could move again, she had suffered acute frostbite in two fingers. The captain discharged her in Copenhagen and upon her release from the hospital where the fingers were amputated, Minerva Dotter found work cleaning a church. She rode the church bicycle to the university library, which had a good collection on hydrology and the polar climbs. When she wasn't writing up her data from Aureus or oiling the church pews, she spoke to her notebook. A pack is beasts who hunt, wild dogs, wolves, sea ice. To be chased by ice and torn apart, I want to go to sea again and be torn. Only a month after she mailed her paper on the contours and tendencies of Arctic sea ice to the Royal Society of London, she received a rejection. The society's board members believe Minerva Dotter had either invented the data or stolen it from a man. Upon reading the terse letter, she held a lit match to the healing stump of her pinky until the skin bubbled. That week, the pews were not oiled. Dust furred the curlicues of the oak, oak, of the oak pu pulpit. In August of 18. 1881, the American explorer, Lieutenant Adolphus Greeley and his team of 25 men and 42 dogs had arrived at Lady Franklin Bay, north of Greenland. They were to gather astronomical 
geological and magnetic data from the Arctic Circle and meant to attain a new farthest north record. The second summer, a ship carrying food and letters for the expedition was blocked by ice and forced to turn back. The third summer, another supply ship was trapped in ice and crushed. Rescue missions were being mounted. Minerva Dotter said to her notebook, I would give two more fingers to go back to sea. Each hand would still have three if we count the thumbs. Kione was a steam powered icebreaker, its bow reinforced with iron. Its crew included a polar hydrologist who specialized in pack ice behavior. The Canadian captain did not wish to be defeated by a few chilled chunks of ocean, and the hydrologist had written a most persuasive letter about his expertise. The hydrologist came aboard at St. John's, Newfoundland, with his face wrapped in red flannel. When Kione sailed from St. John's in May of 1884, the officers started a betting pool. How many of Greeley's men would still be alive when they found him? Ivor Minerva Dotter stood on deck, feeling the salt wind, the slapping waves, the pull of north, smiling behind her scarf. Thank you. Yay. And that story in this collection is absolutely, especially there for, for, for the folks familiar with Le Guin's deep cuts, because um, it's, it's in directly in conversation with a short story of hers called Sewer. All right, let's let's hear what your questions are. You know, your thoughts. I mean, this there's so much to say about Le Guin, you know, and there's so much to say about this anthology. Yeah, I love your lyrical prose style, Lainey. Absolutely. Um, wonderful reading. Yeah, I love all the love from everyone. Um, yeah, so think about, about your comments and questions. Um, there's um, plenty that we can we can just go on to share, you know, in conversation with each other, but would love to hear from all of you as well. Um, we just we just have a lot of clapping and love and hearts. <laughs> well, fair enough. <laughs> in the Q and A, there's some questions. Oh, sorry. I guess I'm failing at that. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I was just looking in the chat. Um, from Daniel Trefethen, I once told Carrie Vaughn her bannerless stories seemed very Le Guinian to me, if that's a word. That should totally be a word. Are there any stories and our authors who seem Le Guinian to you, which you could steer us to? Um, you know, I, I will say to that, I, I think one of the contributors to this anthology, Arwen Spicer, um, she's self-published a number of novels, which I think have not getting, gotten the, the regard, you know, or the attention that they should have. And when I think of, you know, a speculative writer who's, who's most clearly in conversation with Le Guin, I think of Arwen Spicer. Anyone else? Any, any Le Guinian author you can think of? I really would say N.K. Jemison too, who uh, quotes Le Guin as one of her biggest uh, influences. You know, her Broken Earth uh, series is definitely in conversation with a lot of the work of, of Le Guin in, in, on multiple levels, I would say. Um, it's interrogation of the oppressions of uh, one class of people by another, um, the the lies that cultures can tell uh, about you know the other, um, and and then the kind of world shattering reframe when the truth is revealed. Not to <laughs> offer too many spoilers, but the Broken Earth trilogy uh, is astounding and won all of the awards for a reason. Yeah, and um, in, in Nora's collection, I believe it's called One is Black Future Month. How Long Till Black Future Month. How Long Month. Till Black Future Month. Uh, she has a story that is uh, in conversation with uh, the ones who walk away from Omelas, which is kind of uh, a really interesting sort of uh, extension of that conversation about, you know, 
what is it what does it take for a society to like have good things when bad things need to happen or do they or you know how do we how do we even begin to talk about that kind of thing mm -hmm. a couple people in the comments have mentioned kid johnson and molly gloss uh and i would also throw in karen joy fowler uh i believe it was karen joy fowler who wrote the uh the women uh, sorry it, uh, the title referenced the, moment, the women men don't see, but I don't recall the title at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we, had a, we had a fascinating discussion once about whether or not that story was really science fiction, because the story itself has no science fiction elements, but it references, um, um, it references um, the women men don't see, sorry, it references the author's life rather than the story. And is that sufficient to make it a science fiction story? It was published in Fantasy and Science Fiction magazine. So the author, the, the editor of that at least thought it was science fiction. But it's, a, it's interesting to think about what makes some of these works science fiction. Uh, is, it, is it sufficient that they come from somebody who's in the science fiction community? Um, and, uh, and so I think, and, and Ursula has always straddled uh, the line between science fiction and literature yes. uh, in ways that in some ways kind of got her uh, extradited from both of those communities, um, <laughs> but made her a unique and beloved writer. Yeah. Tracy Stepp asks, excited for this book. Thank you, Tracy. How did you choose to work with Forest Avenue Press? Now that's a great question. <laughs> you know, uh, it's always a thing, and uh, those uh, writers here can probably attest to this. Um, you know, you answer a call for an anthology, and sometimes, and and then you get the happy yes, and it's a wonderful thing, and and you you do your little happy dance. But sometimes you find out that your story has been accepted by an editor, but the book has not yet been accepted by a press and is still in this limbo zone. And, and that was somewhat of the story with this anthology. Um, I had received some interest from another local press, but hadn't um, gotten a firm commitment. And I just believed so passionately in this project that you know, I knew I was going to go forward with it in any case. Um, and, and Laura, you know, um, who's here on this uh, event tonight, you know, can attest that I pitched her on this project before it was, uh, I had a manuscript and she was enthusiastic and encouraging, but not ready to accept at that time. You know, so this was an exercise in, in me, honestly, as an editor, just forging ahead with a real vision that I had. I really believed in this project and I believed that I could pull it together and make it amazing. And so when I finally had that manuscript together and, and brought it back to Laura, um, she got really excited about it. And then we were really excited about it together. And that was just the best possible scenario because Forest Avenue Press was my first choice from the beginning. I was very inspired by their anthology, City of Weird, which had published one of my own stories uh, and saw this anthology very much in conversation with it. And, and working with Laura and Gigi and Liz has just been an absolute dream come true. This is a book filled with beautiful small press touches, um, one of which are just gorgeous little illustrations that go that are different for every story and go in between uh, in the line breaks. So that's something you know that you have to look forward to as readers if you if you pick this up. Okay. Another question. Um, Le Guin was a philosopher when it wasn't cool for women. For me specifically, I was and am enlightened by her take on gender and sex, but very much more. How has she shaped your writing and thought? I too came to her through fantasy, but have found her to be instructive, insightful, and philosophically foundational in my late life and in these times. Oh, so much to say there, right? So I, maybe our, our readers could just note one philosophical concept or takeaway from her work that has really stuck with you. How about Curtis? 
Uh, sure. Um, I, well, I'll speak to the the thing that Susan mentioned about my story that's in this anthology, which is um, that it's from a a, a non-human point of view, um, but the the main character um, I still think of as a person. So I think that that whole idea and and I think this comes up in a lot of the what I think of as the the best kind of science fiction, which is examining like what are the boundaries of personhood, right? Like where's where do where do we as you know individuals and as you know communities and societies and culture like where do we draw the line at like what do we consider a person like who gets to have these kinds of you know basic rights and who is denied them and why and what are the sort of things that we look for when we say you know um people say human a lot but i i prefer the word person um, mm -hmm. because you know in science fiction there are a lot of you know often you know aliens robots um other kinds of creatures who are not human, but they are still people in that they are sentient, they are intelligent, um, they have the same right to life that um, you know any any human does, and and also in a lot of you know um, science fiction dealing with the far future, um, there's a a lot of talk about like. Uh, post-human entities, so what humans are going to evolve into or what we're going to turn ourselves into by using technology or you know, genetic modification, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that, um, that was one thing that I think really struck me yeah. early on about uh, Le Guin's writing was you know, looking at these different kinds of perspectives. Um, and you know, uh, as writers, um, craft-wise, there's been a lot of talk in recent years about like, how do you write the other? Right? Yeah. How do you write someone who is not you, who does not have your experience? And, and for me, that's really helped me to, you know, broaden my own horizons, not just as a writer, but just as a, as a human being or a person. It's like, think about what is this world, this reality like for other people who don't have the same traits as I do. Uh -huh. Thank you. Anyone else want to throw in on this? I just want to add um, something that's so inspiring to me as a writer is that Le Guin was supremely uninterested in genre boundaries and genre gatekeeping and anyone saying like, well, this you're this kind of writer. I mean, she did so many things. And um, I think there's a lot of anxiety today among writers of like, well, am I doing this or what kind, you know, what label do I put on myself? And Le Guin did not seem to care about that. Absolutely. <laughs> David, I think is one of the things that makes the Le Guin story a Le Guin story is the things that it isn't. Uh, it's not conventionally structured. It's not about conflict. It's not about the, hero, the hero's journey. It's not about overcoming. Um, these are stories that exist, that flow, but do not, do not have the, you know, the cinematic three act structure. Do not save the cat on page two. You know, they are they're sui generis, they are themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the great things about Ursula is that she never took herself seriously. Um, she published these little chapbooks of poems about cats, um, which, which for, for which I, I, have, I have enormous respect for her. Yeah, yeah. And I would add, you know, speaking as a writer myself, a big thing that I always admire about her work is, um, her imagining outside the current confines of, of our culture and, and her remembrance, her regard for indigenous cultures and life ways, you know, not as some uh, relic of the past, but as a reminder that we do not have an inherently toxic relationship to the planet and to other forms of life that is not inherent to our nature that is inherent to our culture and cultures change and can change and can be changed by people I think that's one of the most inspiring takeaways that I, I have from her work especially coming off of now the amazing journey of reading always coming home which I really recommend for absolutely everyone here but it looks like we're we're uh winding down in terms of time here so I want to, you know, really encourage all of you 
pick up, order this beautiful book. Uh, you know, it's full of everybody of work that is not my own. So I don't feel like I'm bragging and saying that this book is just one of my favorite things I've ever read. Um, and, you know, as of, I think last night at some point, not that I've been obsessively refreshing the Powell's bestseller page at all, but we had risen to, I think, number 15 on that list, ahead of some very sexy Dune reprints, I must say. And, you know, I personally am gunning for that top spot, which is currently occupied by the bathroom book for people not peeing or pooping, but using the bathroom as an escape, which I'm sure is a very worthy title, but um, I would love to see Portland and all of you from wherever you're, you're uh, co calling in from help to, to, to move us up the ranks of those very worthy books and just show some love for Powell's and all the love that they've shown for us um, both for this book and as authors over the years. Um, so thank you so much for, <laughs> yes, it's a real book. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, yes. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining us tonight, Susan and Lainey and David and Curtis and all of you out there. Um, it just, yeah, it means so much to have you all here with us and talk about this fantastic book right here is the book so yeah please please go get a copy of this um you know get it off of pals.com and help everybody out so and uh while you're there check up our lineup of upcoming events and we look forward to seeing you at another event very soon so all right thanks everyone and uh good night all of you Bye. thank good night. you thanks bye. susan yeah. thank you. Bye. Hey, bye. <laughs> bye.